Without further ado, and she really needs no introduction, uh, she's been doing this for an incredibly long time, providing incredible insight and analysis to all of our trends happening on the internet. Uh, Mary Meeker from KCPB. Uh, She's going to do her internet trends report for us to get things kicked off this morning. So welcome, please, Mary Meeker. Thank you. You make up look great. Global internet trends. Global internet users at 3 billion. Growth is flat, up 9% year on year. It's actually decelerating if you exclude India. That's what a declining growth looks like. India internet user growth is actually accelerating, up 40% year on year versus 33% last year. In the fourth quarter of last year, India surpassed the United States to become the number two market for internet users in the world behind China. That's what accelerating growth looks like. <clears throat> Global smartphone user growth is slowing up 21% versus 31% growth last year, and global smartphone unit shipments are slowing dramatically, up 10% versus 28% in the prior year. That's what decelerating growth looks like. Importantly, Android smartphones continue to gain share versus iOS. Um, Android ASP declines continues, and the delta to iOS devices is 3x, so 3x lower. New internet users are going to continue to be harder to find because the new markets are in oftentimes undeveloped and, or less developed and less affluent countries. Can't read the slide right now. It's by McKinsey. It's great. It explains all of that. <laughs> um, and it also shows how in many emerging and developing markets, smartphones are a material cost of per capita income. Global macro trends, I don't always do this, but I want to spend time on it this year because growth around the world is slowing and it's important for all of us to think about it. If we look at GDP growth around the world in six of the last eight years, it has been below the 20 year average. Commodity price trends tell a tale of, of slowing global growth as well. Commodity prices are down 39% since May of 2014. You can see the trending on this chart that started in 2000. Global growth engines over time evolve. In 1985, North America, Europe, and Japan accounted for two-thirds of global GDP growth. By 2015, China and emerging Asia accounted for two-thirds of global GDP growth. The reason I'm telling you that will be clear in a minute. China's gross capital formation, which is dollars spent on capital equipment, roads, and buildings in the last six years was greater than the previous 30 years. That's what that looks like and China's gross capital formation slow, spending slowed in 2015. For those of you that have spent time in China, if you were there in 1987, this was what the Pudong district in, in Shanghai looked like. This is what it looks like in 2016. It's the best example we have visually of showing just how powerful that growth was um, in, in that part of the world. The reimagination of China over the last three decades helped drive incremental gro global growth of the likes, which will be very, very difficult to repeat. Next point is interest rates have fallen to historically low levels. Interest rate trends can be indicative of how people perceive growth will be. Ten-year treasuries are low by historical, historical standards, and global ten-year treasury yields have also trended down. Debt loads over the last two years are high and are rising faster than GDP. More great data from McKinsey. Global government debt is 66% of average debt to GDP up 9% annually over the last eight years, while GDP growth for the 50 major countries grew by just 2%. This looks at total debt to GDP ratios, high, very high, and going up in most countries. Again, data from McKinsey. Next point, demographic trends. Population growth is slowing. This is what slowing population growth looks like, 1.2% per year. Global growth rates are down 39% since 1960. And for many people in the room, Global life expectancy is now 72 years, up 36% since 1960. The net of all this is economic growth is slowing and countries are set up with less margin for error um, than they have had in the, in, the, in the distant past. The net of this is easy growth is behind us. We've lived through five epic growth divers over the last two decades and they're losing some of their momentum. Connectivity growth, as I illustrated, is slowing. Emerging country growth is slowing. Government debt is rising and high 
interest rates have declined, and a lot of the interest rate decline helped fuel a lot of borrowing, and population growth rate and labor force growth rates are slowing. We've lived through several up and down cycles in the last uh, two decades, and this is what they look like. <clears throat> So the net of this is adjusting to slower growth and higher debt and the aging population creates rising risks for all of us, but it also creates a load of opportunities for businesses that can innovate, increase efficiency, lower prices, create jobs, and as we all know, the internet can be at the core of this. So moving back to internet stuff, um, advertising, commerce, and brand trends. Online advertising, the mobile, mobile and the majors and newcomers continue to crank away. U.S. internet advertising growth is accelerating up 20% versus 16% last year. Desk mobile growing very quickly up 66%. Google and Facebook accounted for three quarters and rising share of internet advertising growth in the U.S. And at the margin, advertising, advertisers, advertising remains over indexed to legacy media. Online ad efficacy still has a long way to go. Google has proven that advertising on the internet works, but many online ads, especially video ads, are ineffective. 81% of users mute their ads. 93% consider using ad blocking software. This is data from Unruly. Uh, ad blocking software, especially in China, India, and Indonesia, is a big deal. 420 million users in the world use ad blocking software for mobile devices up nearly 100% year to year. If there's ever been a call to arms to create better ads, uh, this is it. This is data from PageFair. There are ads that work out there. Some of the best come from Snapchat, which I'll spend a little bit of time on, on later. The ads tend to be authentic, entertaining, in context, and they're often brief. These are examples of some Spotify ad, a Spotify ad and a Furious 7 ad that got tens of millions of views on, on, on Snapchat. So moving to commerce and brands, they're evolving rapidly by and for this generation. Each generation has slightly different core values and expectations, often shaped by the events that occur in their lifetimes. Try reading this right now, but the net of it is millennials tend to be more global, more optimistic, and more tolerant. This is data from Acosta. Uh, and millennials tend to be more urban, diverse, and single. Marketing channels evolve over time, shaped by the evolution of technology and media. Each new marketing channel has grown faster than the previous one. This shows internet ramping faster from a dollar spending standpoint than TV, which ran faster than radio. Retailing channels also evolve with time, shaped by the evolution of technology plus distribution. This is the evolution of commerce in the US over the last couple of centuries. We went from stores to more stores to malls to e-commerce. This looks at the new and emerging retailers that have optimized for generational change over the last couple hundred years. J.C. Penney for the GI generation, Meyer, Walmart, Costco, Amazon.com, and brands and companies like Casper for Generation Z and Millennials. Millennials are clearly impacting and evolving retail. Millennials are 27% of the population, largest generation in the United States. Spending power should rise significantly in the next 10 to 20 years. The internet continues to ramp as a retail distribution channel. It's 10% of retail sales less, versus less than 2% in 2000. Retail. In retail, technology, media, and distribution are increasingly intertwined. In retail, as Jeff articulated last night, the new normal, we believe, is companies drive transaction volume, they collect and get user data, they launch new products, and then they often launch private labels. Products become brands, brands become retailers, like Warby Parker. Retailers become products and brands, like Thrive Market, and retailers come into homes, like, Sti like Stitch Fix, which we'll spend time on later. Physical retailers become digital retailers, like Neiman Marcus. Digital retailers become data-optimized physical retailers, like Warby Parker. Connected product users can easily be notified when to buy, notified when to buy and upgrade great products and can benefit from viable sharing. This is an example of, of Ring, the doorbell. Internet-enabled retailers, products, and brands are on the rise. They're bolstered by always-on connectivity, hyper-targeted marketing, images, and personalization. Hyper-targeted marketing is driving growth for retailers, products, and brands. You know that, but there's some data behind it. And Stitch Fix is, for the, 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 the women's, for now, fashion site, um, has created a fabulous service. They're applying Netflix and Spot, Spotify-like content discovery to fashion. Each customer gets a differentiated experience. Nearly 100% of the fixes that are shipped to their customers are unique. They take the data on the users that's completed via survey, they combine it with stylists, 
and they have, they're constantly improving their algorithm, algorithms and they have extremely high customer satisfaction. 100% of the purchases on the site come from their recommendation engine in collaboration with their stylist. 39% of the clients on the site purchase the majority of their clothing from Stitch Fix versus 30% year on year. It's a big deal. If we look and compare internet retailers of this generation, this is a chart that looks at, a, at a, just a small number of the companies that have, a, a, a number of the companies, but there are others, that have reached 100 million in annual sales in less than five years. It took Nike 14 years, Lululemon nine years, and Under Armour eight years. The details are in the footnote, but it's fast and it's impressive. Re I can spend time on it now, but Karen Wall won't give it to me. Reimagining communication via social platforms. I'm going to spend time on video, images, and, and messaging. Visual usage continues to rise. Millennials um, love visual usage. The top engage the engagement leaders for the U.S. for millennials on the web are, are, are Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram. Generation Z loves to communicate with images. Video viewing has evolved a lot over the past century. We started with live linear viewing, traditional TV, on-demand, DVR streaming, then moved to semi-live, which is Snapchat, and real live, Periscope, and Facebook Live. Video usage, sophistication, relevance continues to grow rapidly. This looks at Facebook daily video and Snapchat daily video growth. Smartphone usage is increasingly a camera, plus storytelling, plus creativity, plus messaging and sharing. Snapchat, in our view, has created a trifecta for this. Communications plus video plus a platform started with personal stories, moved to personal plus professionally created live stories, and has moved to professional curated stories with Discover. Advertisers and brands are clearly finding their way into this stuff. Brand filters integrated into Snapchat by users often geofenced and in venue. The World AIDS Day joined the fight by Red uh, effort on Snapchat got 76 million views. Branded Snapchat lenses and Facebook filters are increasingly applied by users. The Taco Bell Cinco de Mayo lens had 224 million views. That's almost twice the viewing of the Super Bowl. The Gatorade Super Bowl lens, I believe, got more views than the Super Bowl did. Go figure. Real Live and, uh, is in um, it Real Live um, is in Facebook Live and, and uh, Periscope are a new paradigm for live broadcasting. Um, we know what this is, but this is user-generated content at whole new orders of viewing magnitude. Candace Payne's Chewbacca mask, 153 million views. Kohl's mentioned two times in the video. Kohl's became the leading, one of the leading apps in the USA iOS app store, and Chewbacca mask demand has gone through the roof. Um, this is a special which will not be pasted on the web, but this is Karen Walt, this is Walton Kara, and this is Walton Kara with those lovely masks that we've all fallen in love with. So live sports viewing has always been social, but in many ways it's just getting started. How often are you able to watch a game on the sidelines or TV with all your friends who share your team love? Live streaming wrapped with social media tools help make that more of a reality. 2016, we believe, is a milestone year for traditional live streaming on social networks. NFL will, will broadcast live Thursday Night Football on Twitter. You'll be able to have live broadcast analysis scores, replays, notifications, social media, and social media tools. We think it's really exciting. Image usage and sophistication and relevance continues to grow very rapidly. Image growth remains strong. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna be really fast now. This has been nothing compared to what I'm about to do. <clears throat> Images, monetization op op options are rising. Image-based platforms like Pinterest are often used for finding and shopping for products. Image-based platforms like OfferUp show high and rising engagement levels and are often used for com commerce. OfferUp is in the middle here. Offer up is ramping faster than eBay did at the same stage. Image-based platform House continues to have another trifecta, content community and commerce continues to ramp. They launch View in My Room and Sketch, have three to four times higher engagement and 5x higher purchase conversion, something people have been waiting for for a long time and it's happening. Messaging is evolving rapidly. Um, we know the leaders. Messaging is involving to more expressive communication. This is the evolution of emoticons, in effect, and self-expression um, over the years. It's involving just from so simple social conversations to business-related conversations. The Asia-based messaging leaders continue to expand uses, services beyond social me messaging, whether it's banking or whether it's grocery delivery. Messaging secret sauce, and we think this is a big deal, is the magic of the thread. It's conversational. It remembers identity, time, specifics, preferences, and context. These are examples from Facebook Messenger of Hyatt and Rogers Communications and how customer satisfaction has gone up. 
messaging platforms, conversational commerce is beginning. This is an example of a shopper in Thailand in Instagram who looks for, finds the product and converts payment and, and, and purchase the product on, on the line messaging service. The best way to contact millennials is social media and chat. The worst way is telephone. We intuit that. Here's the data behind it. Android and iOS home screens like portals and Internet 1.0 were, mobile, were the mobile, used to be the mobile power alleys. Messaging leaders want to change that. Messaging apps are increasingly becoming the second home screen. This compares iOS with the Facebook Messenger inbox. So moving to human computer interfaces, voice, which I'm running out of time for, reimagining voice, a new paradigm in computer, human computer interaction. This is, looks at the evolution of computer interaction over the last couple hundred years. We've gone from touch 1.0 to touch 2.0 to touch 3.0, and we've just arrived at voice. Why now? Voice is fast and easy. It's personalized. It's context driven, and it's keyboard free. The reason, the key to success of voice interaction um, is 99% accuracy and understanding plus low latency. Google just shared this data. Machine speech recognition is now at the human level for voice search in low noise environments per Google. Voice word accuracy rates are improving rapidly. We're at 90% accuracy or more for major platforms. This looks at data from Baidu, Google, and Hound. Computing interfaces evolving from keyboards to microphones and keyboards, and we're still in the early innings. Mobile voice assistant usage is rising rapidly, driven by tech improvements. Voice search queries are up 35x since 2008. And importantly, call mom is more relevant than call dad. <laughs> but the good news is call dad is still important. Baidu voice input growth also and output growth also growing rapidly. And Hound is showing that, that queries are very broad. Local information, personal assistance, fun and entertainment, and general information. This looks at how uh, voice search share is gaining on US Android, Baidu, and, and the Bing taskbar. Voice as a computing interface, hands and vision free, expands the concept of always on. It's a top reason to use it is that, and people want to use it at home, in the car, and on the go. Platforms are being built. Third party developers are moving quickly. This is a little data behind what Jeff talked about last night on the Alexa voice platform. 950 skills versus 46 skill, 14 skills uh, in September of 2015. The goal of the Amazon Alexa voice platform at the start, it's faster and easier shopping on Amazon with the potential to be much more. 5% of Amazon user, um, USA users per, per CIRP own an Echo, up from 2% year on year. 4 million units sold since, since launch. Compu the computing industry inflection points are typically only obvious with hindsight. So ask the question, iPhone sales may have peaked in 2015, per most anal analyst estimates that are out there, while Amazon Echo sales are just beginning to take off. Food for thought. We're also reimagining transportation. It's another para a paradigm, in, a new paradigm in human computer interaction. Is it a phone? Is it a camera? Is it a car? Is it a computer? One can now lock, monitor, summon one's Tesla from one's wrist. Car industry evolution. Computerization is accelerating. The evolution since pre-1980s with cars, we've gone from mechanical, electrical, to simple processors to computers. Uh, this looks at car automation accuracy and safety improvements. They're also accelerating. There's a lot of data behind that. Autonomous vehicle and ADAS features continue to improve and miles driven continue to rise. There are two approaches to autonomous vehicle rollouts. There's the Google approach, which is all new, top-down, fully autonomous vehicles. And there's the assimilation approach, uh, spearheaded at, in part by Tesla, a gradual rollout in mixed, in mixed fleet environments. The history of the car industry is, has been driven by innovation. The US led, the US fell. This looks like global car production share in the US. Cars produced in the US for global distribution now are 13%. In 1950, they were at 76%. Population of Detroit tells that story. The good news is car industry innovation is accelerating. We believe the United States has the potential to be the global hub of the auto industry again. We have the incumbents, GM and Ford. We have the attackers, Tesla. We have systems and components leadership. We have autonomous vehicles, Google, Tesla, Uber, mobility and fleet innovation, Uber, Lyft, and others. And we have education and university innovation, whether it's Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, UC Berkeley, et cetera, MIT. Regulation can be an opportunity here, or it can be an issue. I'm not going to read through these points, but um, Mark Fields went through a bit of them last night. Sort of humorous, but sort of interesting to look back 
regulators are always are slow to typically adapt new technologies. Back in the day when horseless carriages came along, there was a, a red flag act in the UK um, that where someone had to walk in front of the, the, the horseless carriage with a flag to make sure people were not run over. Um, and Travis Kalanick did a great job of describing the history of jitneys in Los Angeles at uh, the TED conference. Um, I'm going to skip that slide in the interest of time. So we're reimagining transportation. Mobility is also being reimagined. Car ownership costs, money, and time are high. You guys know that. Efficiency gain potential from ride and car sharing, we believe, is also high. We ask Uber, why are people using your platform? What's the list? 93% do it to get to their destination quickly. 87% do it for safety. 84% because they've had too much alcohol to drive. And I'll leave it at that. Um, Uber Pool is now at 20% of global Uber rides in just in less than two years. And we asked the question, are we re reimagining the most important seat in the car? This Mark Fields addressed this a little bit last night. Is it the back seat again? Interestingly, commute time e almost equals the amount of time people spend on Facebook and Spotify. I'll let you think about that one. Transportation industry strap in for the, new, the, next, the next few decades. We may be entering an automotive industry Golden age, take two, TBD. So China, the data from Hill House Capital. Macro, robust service-driven job and income growth despite investment slowdown. That's what that looks like. China services industries job growth is accelerating. China urban disposal income per capita continues to grow, but at slower rates. China internet users up 6% versus 7% last year. China mobile internet usage leaders, Tencent, Alibaba, and Baidu, 71% of mobile time spent. A lot of, in a lot of areas, China leads the US in online advertising, 42% of total ad spend versus 39% in the US. E-commerce, the China's e-commerce companies dominate the top retailer rankings versus their US peers. They're growing faster than their US peers, and 31% of WeChat users have made a purchase via WeChat on that messaging platform. WeChat Chinese New Year payments, 8 billion virtual red envelopes sent on Chinese New Year this year, up 8% year on year. And they're finding that WeChat payments can drive merchant loyalty, which back to the messaging point, makes the merchants happy. Ant Financial, a powerhouse, $60 billion um, valuation, leveraging Alibaba, Alibaba Alipay, $1 trillion in payment volume in 2015. China Internet emerging momentum in on-demand, 70% global share of on-demand transportation. How about that for leadership? This look, the red lines look at the growth of monthly trips since inception for Uber versus Uber for the rest of the world. Public and private company data, I'm gonna get through this. Impact of the internet is extraordinary and broad, but in many ways, it's just beginning. We've been, many of us have been around the internet for a long period of time. This looks at Viacom's market cap in 2006, 33 billion, now 18 billion looks at Netflix market cap 1.4 billion in 2006 versus that 33, and the market cap is now 44 billion versus 18 billion. We go through a few examples of that on, on this slide. The current generation of leaders is growing faster than the previous generation, Uber growing faster than eBay, JD.com growing faster than Amazon.com, Slack growing faster than Salesforce. The internet leaders are big and getting bigger and staying aggressive. Apple, Google, Amazon.com, Facebook, Tencent, Alibaba, and others are flush with cash, and the companies are well represented. This is the top 20 internet companies globally based on market cap. Traditional in industry incumbents are active in acquisitions and investments. They're increasingly betting on technology companies to fuel growth. Non-tech acquisitions of tech companies up 2.6% since 2012. This is data from Morgan Stanley. Global tech financings are solid in private financings, but there were only two tech IPOs in 2016. Again, some data from Morgan Stanley that shows that. And the last point I'm going to close with, which I closed with before and might have closed with before and might have closed with before, uh, but there are pockets of internet company overvaluation, but there are also pockets of undervaluation. Very few companies win. Those that do can win big. Over time, the best rule of thumb for valuing companies is the value of the business is the present value of future cash flows. And with that, I have one second to go, and there's a disclosure. Thank you for your patience.